The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them in the fire of thy love. Set forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us. And may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. And O Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for us. us. Then of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hello, and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V, and he is also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you tonight? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. Good. Better than I deserve, as a famous host says. Right? <laughs> there you go. And grateful, as another yeah. person says, in answer to that question every yeah. time. So. Can't beat that. Well, Father, I would like to continue our treatment of the mysteries of the rosary tonight. We received a lot of great feedback, um, several comments and emails pertaining to the first program that we did on the Annunciation. And so tonight I would like to focus on the second joyful mystery, the visitation of our Blessed Mother when she visited St. Elizabeth. And, uh, Father, in this mystery, we see the first great mission of the Blessed Mother with the newly conceived Christ child. She was sent to visit her cousin, St. Elizabeth. She was sent to bring the newly conceived Christ child to St. John the Baptist, who was that time uh, in the womb of St. Elizabeth. So, Father, what, what do we have to learn from this great first mission of the Blessed Mother and the visitation? Her... Uh readiness to be the handmaid of the Lord and to do whatever she was instructed to do. As you say, it's the first great mission of Our Lady. Sometimes the second joyful mystery, I think, uh, becomes um, a matter of simply uh, envisioning um, our Blessed Mother's arrival at the home of Elizabeth, which is certainly the salient point, right, that arrival, and that encounter of uh, our Blessed Mother and her kinswoman, Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth, and of course, our Lord and St. John the Baptist. Uh, that is the salient part of the, of the mystery indeed, but we shouldn't overlook the fact that, that we are told in Sacred Scripture that our, our Lady went into the hill country of Judea, right? So to the west of Jerusalem, our Lady went into the hill country and she went to the home of Elizabeth. But she did so, instructed by the Holy Ghost, on a mission. This was, as you say, Our Lady's first great mission. And when we contemplate this mystery and praying the second joyful mystery, we should think of it that way. We should be aware of the fact that this was our Blessed Mother's first great mission. And uh, we should also be aware of when it took place. Remember, our Lady had been told by the angel Gabriel that uh, John the Baptist had been conceived in his mother, in Elizabeth's womb, six months before. And so Our Lady went to the hill country, to the home of Elizabeth, within that three-month period. Our Lady was present there for the, baptism, for the birth of John the Baptist while he was still within his mother's womb. In the three mo last months of his gest gestation, Our Lady came to him and uh, took to him our blessed Lord. And here, these two uh, great personages, of course, God incarnate in the womb of our blessed mother, and his precursor, St. John the Baptist. Um, as you said, our Lord newly conceived in the womb, newly conceived in the womb of Our Lady, and Saint John the Baptist approaching the time of his birth, right? And uh, Our Lady brought them together, and it was the sound of her voice that caused Saint John the Baptist to leap within the womb of his mother Elizabeth. 
something about Our Lady's voice announced to John the Baptist the presence of his Savior and the one to whom his own life was dedicated, that he was chosen to be the announcer to the world of the presence of the Savior after all of those centuries of waiting. And it was the voice of Mary that was announcing to him there in his mother's womb that the Savior had come. So, as I mentioned before, she was in a sense St. John the Baptist, St. John the Baptist, mm -hmm. because he was announcing to the precursor, but he was then to later to announce to the entire world uh, on the banks of the Jordan River. When I say to the entire world, certainly there was a microcosm of humanity there from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the simple people of the Jews, and also the pagans, even the Roman soldiers were there. Uh, listening to John the Baptist. So he really did, in that sense, announce to the world that representative humanity, uh, the fact that the Lamb of God had come to take away the sins of the world was present among them. So we see, we see the, the role of Our Lady already being very neatly defined here, that her role is to bring the Christ into the world and then to bring him to humanity. Right, starting with John the Baptist. And uh, it is still Our Lady's role, even now. Uh, from heaven, it is her role to bring our Lord to us. And uh, that is why we, we honor her as having a very special role that is a relationship with us and each of our souls as a mother given to us, a spiritual mother given to us, but also... She, she has a very special relationship with our Lord himself. And um, because of that special relationship she has with him, she loves him in a unique way. Uh, there is no other creature alive, there's no other creature in existence, and nor will there ever be, who can love her as she loves him. Because she loves him as her creator. She loves him as her redeemer. We love our Lord in a way, we as human beings love him in a way that even the angels cannot love him because the angels love him as their creator, but they cannot love him as their redeemer. They don't have the relationship with him. We do. In heaven, we'll have the relationship to him as our savior. <clears throat> but our blessed mother through all of this has a unique relationship as an individual to God because she is his mother. And that altogether unique relationship that she personally has to the Son of God means that she has a love for him as a mother loves her own child. And that sets her apart from all the rest of creation, both angelic and human. And uh, it also helps us to, to uh, realize that our Blessed Mother fulfilled the first and therefore second great commandments, that she really did love the Lord her God with all of her heart and all of her mind and all of her soul and all of her strength. She had loved him with this perfect love, with all of her powers of loving. And this is the key to her exaltation on earth as the Mother of God and in heaven now as the queen of angels and saints. We see this, this active in her from the very beginning. Uh, we see this active in Our Lady here, that she is at the service of our Lord as Savior. She gives him everything she has. Before he has a heart of his own, she gives him her heart, so that he and she are sharing her heart. The power of her feet, her legs, carrying him to, um, to John the Baptist at the command of God. Her arms are holding him. Her voice is serenading him, you might say, uh, singing to him. And, and her soothing, beautiful voice, which is very soft and very soothing, but also very penetrating. Heaven knows the sinners know the penetrating power of the voice of our Blessed Mother. When they have completely 
closed the door against our Lord and locked it shut and put their fingers in their ears and do everything they can to drown out the voice of God, somehow the Blessed Mother's voice penetrates into those, those uh, poor forlorn souls. And uh, so God uses her to bring the Christ child into the hearts of mankind to this day. And that second joyful mystery is what that, that is all about. That's where that mission began. And, you know, Father, we read in the writings of St. Louis de Montfort and St. Francis de Sales, as well as other saints, this idea of going to Christ through Mary. And perhaps in St. John the Baptist, we have the, uh, the, the prime example of that. You could perhaps say that he was the first saint to go to Christ through Mary and um, look at the, the greatness of St. John the Baptist. Our Lord said that there was no greater man, no, no greater prophet born, born of woman. So do you think, Father, that St. John the Baptist could be almost the, the perfect example of why this idea of going to Christ through Mary is so powerful? Well, I do, but I also think that it is our Lord who went to John the Baptist through Mary. I mean, that, that is true of the second joyful mystery. Our Lord came to John the Baptist through Mary. It was her voice that announced the presence of the Christ child to John the Baptist. He leaped for joy, and we're told by the church's doctors and theologians that that is when he was, uh, he received the grace of baptism, you might say, in the sense that his soul, even in, in his mother's womb, was purified of original sin. And not only justified from sin, but elevated supernaturally to the state of sanctifying grace at that moment. And uh, that our, our Lord did that from the womb of Mary to the womb of Elizabeth. He uh, gave John the Baptist the graces of justification and sanctification. Um, so that John the Baptist was born without original sin. He wasn't conceived without original sin. But actually, at the time of his birth, he had been justified and sanctified. And so our Lord could actually say, and this is what gives you an understanding of his words, when he says, no man greater has been born of woman than John the Baptist. <clears throat> and that would make perfect sense, theologically, if he was the first man born of woman in the history of mankind who had been born without original sin and in the state of sanctifying grace. Right? There had been no other, right? right. right. So... Um, he was referring to not just a human being born of woman, but a man born of woman right. without original sin. Father, I think one, one thing that's uh, rather fascinating to consider when uh, we're talking about this second joyful mystery of the visitation is uh, just the, the magnitude of the persons present here. I mean, in the history of the entire world, has there ever been a greater assemblage of, of holier person. You, you know, you have our Lord incarnate there, our blessed Lord. We have our, uh, his blessed mother. We have St. Elizabeth, her husband, St. Zachary. We have uh, John the Baptist. Perhaps uh, St. Joseph was there. Has there ever been, in the history of the entire world, a holier assemblage of persons? At the cross, perhaps, right? Okay. Our Lord, yeah. our blessed mother, St. John, the apostle, St. Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. right? And the holy women who were there, could be quite confident that they save their souls too, right? And uh, so, you know, when our Lord says of St. John the Baptist that there is no man greater born of woman, because he was born without original sin, had been justified from sin and sanctified, he wasn't saying uh, that John the Baptist is greater than any of the other saints in heaven. You know, I would say greater than uh, St. John the Apostle. Um, so I, I think under the cross you'd find certainly a, uh, an assemblage of holy persons uh, that would right. rival, <laughs> they're well, obviously not rival, you know, <laughs> but could have been the holiest assemblage of persons in the history of mankind. Okay. okay. Well, Father, another aspect to consider um, in this, this visitation is the charity of our Blessed Mother towards her cousin, St. Elizabeth. It, uh, it seems that that is a very, um, very central point that the, the Church wishes us to meditate on. 
So what do we have to learn? Why was this charity of the Blessed Mother so great in going to visit St. Elizabeth and, and helping her out? What, what do we have to learn from that? Charity, <laughs> as you say. You know, God sent her on a mission, right? Mm -hmm. So it is true. I mean, uh, she wasn't simply following orders and going because she was told to go. She was prompted to go by the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost was using her own charity, you know, her love toward God, her love to Elizabeth. She knew that Elizabeth was up in years, right? Such so, uh, so much so, in fact, that when word was conveyed to Zachary, her husband, uh, in the temple, that uh, his wife Elizabeth would bear a child, and they were childless into old age, he, he didn't believe it. He thought it was rather almost comical to think in an advanced old age she should conceive. He should have remembered the example of Abraham and, and Sarah long before, though. That's why he was struck dumb. Um, and um, it wasn't until nine months later that they came to him with a writing tablet and told him, well, well how would you name this child? And, uh, you know, he wrote John as his name, and then his tongue was loosed, and he was able to speak again. Right? So the idea that, uh, you know, Zachary would find it incredible that his wife Sarah, his wife uh, Elizabeth, would bear a child at that age, we've got to tell you, that she was up in years, and she would certainly need assistance, and our Blessed Mother was at the service of charity. I mean, she considered herself the handmaid of the Lord, which is exactly what she was. Um, but she was moved by charity uh, as part of that service to God. And so uh, she was moved by, you're right, not only the first joy, the first great commandment, but she was moved by the second great commandment too, uh, out of charity for her kinswoman, Elizabeth, to be there. And she stayed with Elizabeth threw to the birth of John the Baptist. Hmm. Father, what are some practical things that we can do to imitate the Blessed Mother's charity towards St. Elizabeth? How can we imitate that? Well, again, to be willing to help where help is needed. Especially, we see in the world today, we see uh, families who are trying to be Catholic families, and they're trying to give life as God commands. Um, nowadays, it is harder perhaps than it has been in the past because uh, those who do give life and nurture life and dedicate their lives to doing that, to fulfilling that purpose of God in their marriage, are, um, uh, well, sometimes they're looked down upon by the society around us, abandoned often by <clears throat> the extended family, you know, in the old days, uh, the pe people understood that this was why they married. This was their purpose, to give life. That was the great joy, the great mission in their life was to give life in obedience to God's command. And nowadays, it is despised. I mean, even pro-life, even people who claim they're pro-life in anti-abortion, when it comes down to the idea of giving life, they, they, they just have this selfish idea, well, what I, why, why would I want to encumber and complicate my own life? <clears throat> and certainly, why would I want then, if I'm not going to encumber my own life by, uh, you know, cl cluttering my life with other ch with children to take care of, why on earth would I, would I then be willing to go and help others who are cluttering their life? Why would I want to let them clutter my life with their children? And so they, they just don't want to be involved that much. Um, children are a lot of work. You might have noticed that. <laughs> Just a little bit. Even even good children, right? Yes. Even the best. They're yes. children. That's why they have parents. And um, they are a lot of work, and they take a lot of generosity and a lot of charity, uh, a lot of love. And um, so, the, you know, in the old days, the extended families uh, worked together and uh, took, took care of each other, and we often lack that these days. Um the generation that is now, let's say, my generation, um, unfortunately, might be one of the last 
that really has that the sense of just giving and giving and giving, you know, and not um, thinking selfishly, you know, about that. So it is very important that we learn from the example of our Blessed Mother in the second joyful mystery to be at the, at the uh, well, the, the handmaid of the Lord, and to follow that example of Our Lady as our Lord's handmaid, to be there at the service of those who need help. Uh, there are those who are actually called to the single state of life. And they are called to the single state of life precisely to be at the service of those who need them, because they are not uh, responsible for other lives. Um, and you might say, therefore, that leaves them free to use their liberty at the service of our Lord, to help those who need their help. Uh, that is their vocation. You know? Unfortunately, there are many of those who are living the single life who think, well, I'm living the single life because I want to be free of any responsibilities. I don't want to have responsibilities because responsibilities automatically impose obligations and obligations take away my liberty to do as I please, to earn my own money, spend my own money on myself, Go where I want, do what I want, whatever I want, and enjoy life. You know, people. This is the way people think these days. This is what leads to abortion, right? And uh, you know, un, the unstated um, truth of the matter is that uh, I mean, they want to live their own lives, including the way they live their immoral, debauched, and uh, perverted lives in terms of impurities. They don't want. It. They will not break any encumbrance or any restraint, and so that is why they start with the idea that this uh, activity, right, the impure activity, <clears throat> it's all about me and my personal gratification, and no one can stand in my way. No one, and if anyone tries, they, I will, I will, even to the point I will kill them. You know. And this is where the child gets in the way. And no one is willing to say this, it seems, uh, on the public scene, because they wouldn't dare because of the, the commonly accepted idea that you can't interfere with the way somebody lives his or her life when it comes to this matter of you know, responsibility and purity. No one dares to dictate. You, you, you can't do this, and if you do, you are responsible for the life you conceive. They will not... They will not tolerate that. <clears throat> well, as I say, there are even people who claim to be pro-life, who have an anti-life mentality when it comes to having children and caring for children and helping others care, helping others care for children. <clears throat> and they will not go out of their way or um, make a sacrifice or even think in, think in terms of, think, what can I do? What can I do to help? You know, uh, and to have an influence on, on these children who are growing up. What can I give of myself for them? But that's what everyone, everyone should think in those terms. <clears throat> not just those who are single, but everyone. Uh, not just mothers and fathers, um, who these days can be easily, easily overwhelmed by the situation in the world today, and raising children in the world today. But everyone should think in terms of that, because, let's face it, we are all... Um, we are all beholden to God who gives life and uh, to the fact that this is how we ourselves have received life. And how do we make a return to God and uh, all the blessings that he's given us, the blessing of life itself, but by being at the service of life. And that means that very practically, not just carrying a sign in the abortion clinic for you know, an hour a week or a month, if they think that's a matter of that's the extent of being pro-life, then they're mistaken. <clears throat> it has to do with taking care of the children who are who are here already, who are born, and uh, showing that they're willing to uh, give of themselves, themselves, their time, and their energies to to help families raise their children if they can be of service. Well, Father, one last thing that I wanted to mention as we're discussing the visitation is the Magnificat of Our Lady. We, we briefly touched on this in the last program, but could you just kind of recap for us why are Our Lady's words, why are they so beautiful and so powerful, and what do we have to learn from them? Well, Our Lady responded to Elizabeth 
Uh, Elizabeth said that, you know, blessed is she who has believed that God's word will be done for her, accomplished in her, right? And Our Lady did, clearly. And uh, Our Lady, St. Elizabeth even repeated the words of the angel, right? Uh, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And so this was a sign to Our Lady, um, you might say a reward to her, to her absolute trust in God, that the angel's word would be accomplished. And um, so Our Lady was inspired by the Holy Ghost to actually express, uh, as I say, by divine inspiration, what it is that made her the handmaid of the Lord. And she began with the words, My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. And that is the formula, you might say, of Our Lady's holiness. This is what made her the hand of the Lord, okay? in the sense that her soul magnified the Lord. What does it mean? How can you, how can you magnify God? I mean, you can't, right? It's infinite, right? How do you magnify the infinite? But we think of a magnifier as something that takes something that would be otherwise invisible and makes it visible. It enables us to see it, not because in itself it is, it is not something great, but because our eyes are so poor that we can't make it out. And so we might even say Our Lady was a kind of lens through which mankind could see the greatness of God. And this is what she wanted to, to do. She wanted to glorify God, and, uh, and that is what her entire life was about, glorifying God in this world. And uh, she rejoiced in God her Savior, and this is again the key to her sinlessness, because she was not only conceived without sin, but she remained without sin, despite all the temptations that she endured. Um, I mean, she had to suffer with our Lord as only a mother could suffer with her own child. And um, so to say that Our Lady uh, was conceived without sin and, and without, without original sin lived her life without it, does that not mean that she was free from suffering and that she was free from temptation? If Our Lord was subject to temptation, certainly Our Lady would have to be subject to temptation also. And what greater temptation could a mother suffer than to see her child suffer. And in this case with Our Lady, she was not even allowed to offer him any comfort or come to intervene in any way. She was forbidden to do that. Now talk about a martyrdom, a mother's martyrdom. Uh, um, Veronica was allowed to wipe our Lord's face, right? But Mary was not, right? She could not raise, raise a hand or a finger to relieve him any, any of the suffering. Rather, her role was to suffer it with him. And so uh, we see in our, our Blessed Mother uh, something that we don't see in sinners, and that is sinners rejoice in something that is... They, they, they don't rejoice in evil so much, but they put something in the, face, in the place of God in their lives, in their hearts, in their souls, and they say by sin, I prefer this. I love this more than God. I love this more than my Creator. I love this more than my Savior. I choose this. And therefore, a God who, who demands that I love Him with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my strength and all of my mind, all of my will, that God has no place has to give way to this because I choose to love this more than to love him. And it's basically, mortal sin in particular, is, a, is basically a decision to tell God, get out of my soul. <clears throat> it is a proclamation to Satan, you are my Lord because I obey you. You know, you tempt me to this and I do as you wish. And so Satan takes that as our unmistakable adoration of him and acknowledgement of him, 
of him as our, as our Lord when we commit mortal sin. That's how he takes it. And he craves that, right? <clears throat> For us to consider him our Lord. By mortal sin, we... That's what he understood. That's what he understands, and how could he not? I mean, it makes sense in a perverse sort of way. So, in other words, um, Our Lady never did that. When she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my <clears throat> spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, what she's actually saying is, her joy, her love, was always in God. And she never chose anything in his place, which is the very essence of sin, right? Uh, the conversio ad creatura, the turning toward the creature, the adversio ad deo, the turning away from God, our lady never did that. <clears throat> she always found her joy in him because her love was always there, securely in him. Uh, that is the key to real holiness. You know? And so we have, it's as simple as that. Now what Our Lady went on to say, of course, is that Almighty God was able to exalt her because of her loveliness, because she was so lowly, certainly in her own mind, you know, she understood that. It was because of her humility, not because of her talents or not because of anything of herself that God actually exalted her and raised her to such a high level. Which leads us to understand that um, when our Lord says the words, he who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted, that that not humiliating oneself but humbling oneself before God and recognizing that whatever one is, of whatever good there is in any, anyone, so whatever positive there is in anyone, not the negative failure, not the emptiness that is evil, but whatever one is, is of God, right? That, that is the essence of, of humility. And we find that in Our Lady. So again, um, Our Lady is giving us in the Magnificat actually the formula to explain herself. I mean, who she is. Who she sees herself in, even, as in the eyes of God. And um, so she's spelling out for us, basically, um, the, the path we should follow. That is the example that God has given us in her to follow to holiness, uh, not to seek to exalt ourselves, as Lucifer did, but to uh, simply find in God all of our joy, to be true to him and place all of our love there in him, to seek to glorify him in all things, not ourselves, and then to have confidence that he has the power to exalt the lowly, as he has the power to humble the those who would exalt themselves. So, uh, in, in any case, in our Blessed Mother, we find the supreme example of that. This is why, you know, God places her there in this very special role for the salvation of every single soul. Right. Well, Father, I think that's a beautiful thought to end on. I am uh, definitely looking forward to the, the rest of the series and the rest of the mysteries. So, thank well, you. you know, Tom, uh, a couple of years ago, I did concentrate on this in the retreat. Um, and so I recommend that uh, you know, people come to the retreats when we offer them, as we do each June. And uh, perhaps we could even get the recordings of those uh, treatment. We went, I went through all of the 15 mysteries of the rosary yes. in the retreat. And so, um, you know, people who were at the retreat might consider this to be a little redundant. Perhaps not. Perhaps it would just be a refresher. But those who weren't, uh, certainly I, I, I would like to think that they'd be of some benefit. So I appreciate the opportunity to. Mm -hmm. I always appreciate the opportunity to talk about the mysteries of the rosary. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you for being here tonight, Father. Thanks. Thank you for your sure. time. Very welcome, Tom. Thank you.
Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima, to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and also to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.